Thank you. Thank you, thank you, and welcome, my Father Mitch Pack, and welcome to Threshold of Hope, where we take a look at the writings of the church. And I just want to mention that today, May 31st, is the feast of the visitation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, where she went to her kinwoman, kinswoman, Elizabeth. A lot of times they say cousin, but it was uh, cousin the way Shakespeare used it, you know, when, you know, they just called all sorts of relatives cousin. Um, but a kinswoman is the proper Greek word. And it's a very important event because during it, we see that Elizabeth and John the Baptist in her womb are both filled with the Holy Spirit and rejoice in the Holy Spirit and exalt in Him. And key words come out. Such a, you know, a matter of fact, Elizabeth gives a number of blessings, which is somewhat unusual. Remember, her husband, Zechariah, was the priest, but she speaks the words of blessing, beatitudes. Blessed are you among women, meaning you're the most blessed of all women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Blessed is she who believed all that the Lord said to her. And then Our Lady responds with the Magnificat. And this great prayer of her own humility, but also of God's victory over evil through the incarnation of his son in her womb. This is what we celebrate today. Well, we are continuing on with Veritatis Splendor. And if you want to get a paperback copy, you can go to EWTN's Religious Catalog. Uh, either online, EWTNRC.com, or you can call them, 1-800-854-6316. If you prefer, you can download a free electronic copy of Veritati Splendor by going to our document library at our website, EWTN.com. Type in Veritati Splendor, and you can download it. Now, of course, we want you to be involved and participate in the show. You can come right here to our studios in beautiful Irondale, Alabama, uh, right next door to Birmingham. Or you can send a question by email, writing to threshold at EWTN.com. Or call during our live broadcast, which is on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, so adjust your time. Uh, and the phone number, if you are in North America, is 1-800-221-9460. If you are outside North America or inside the Birmingham area, it's 205-271-2980. All right. We are now beginning, uh, par or, well, actually, we're in the middle of paragraph 78, or 78.2. And the Pope is continuing his critique of those philosophies, those moral philosophies, that said your intention and the final result and your intention to have a certain final result is what makes an action moral. And so all about your intention, whatever you want. And he responds and he says that the reason why a good intention is not itself sufficient, it's not enough to have a good intention. Instead, you also have to have a correct choice of action. The action itself must be good because the action by a human being, the human act, depends on its object. And the object to be morally good requires the act to be capable of being ordered to God or not ordered to God makes it immoral. So every action that we do can bring you closer to God and give glory to God 
and serve the purposes his wisdom has placed into the world? Or the action, even one done with good intentions, can be against the uh, goal of serving God and being ordered to God. Because it is God who alone is good. Remember, he quotes that from the Gospel of Matthew that we've been talking about with the rich young man. So God alone is good, and God is the one, the only one, who brings about the perfection of the person. But the person must choose to do an act that is itself ordered toward the goodness of God, and not just on one's own good intention. An act is therefore good if its object is in conformity with the good of the person, with respect to the goods morally relevant to the person. So what is it that's going to be good for the person doing the action? And behind that statement, for it to be good for the person, the ultimate good of every person is to give glory to God and to be with him for all eternity, doing what he asks of us. So that Christian ethics pays particular attention to the moral object, that is, it is necessary for Christians to look at the goodness of the act and how the act is ordered to God and is going to give him glory. And he does not refuse, uh, uh, when doing a moral act, a person does not um, refuse to consider the interior Teleology. Remember that word teleology. We've been using it a lot. Teleology means a study of the end or of the goals, the ultimate goal, goals. And that's one of the keys that we have to keep in mind, that actions have inside of themselves, apart from the intention of the person, they have an act within themselves that is oriented towards God or oriented away from God. And this means we have to promote the true good of the person. But we also see that it tries to, that, that when we deal with our moral actions, we are recognizing that the true good is pursued only when the essential elements of human nature are respected. And this is a challenge in our culture because we live in a society where relativism is so typical and a lot of people don't see the ultimate purpose of human beings. They don't see that there's a goal. They try to say, well, it's whatever I feel is good for me, rather than using human reason to think through the issues and look at whether or not their action promotes the true good of the person or whether it promotes a pseudo good. Usually people have a good intention of some sort. For instance, you know, you can go to the great dictators of the 20th century. They wanted a perfect society. The problem is they saw other people getting in the way, so in order to stop certain people from messing up society, they killed tens of millions of them. In fact, 
All the dictators of the 20th century are responsible for killing 305 million people, usually to promote their ideology through war or through genocide. So those goals, their intention personally was good, but the means they did it, that is, by destroying human lives, innocent human beings, who had done nothing wrong except to be of a racial or ethnic or religious background they disliked or th thought was bad. And they did evil acts to promote their perfect Marxist society or their perfect socialist society in the case of National Socialism or Nazism. So this is something that we have to keep in mind that the human act, which is uh, good, is capable of being ordered to its ultimate end. And that ultimate end is God himself. And that same act attains its ultimate and decisive perfection when the will actually does order it to God through charity. So it's not even ordering your actions to God as a theory, but through charity. Charity that is the love of God first with your whole heart, mind, and soul. But you also order your actions towards God when you act out of charity towards your neighbor. And this is uh, how you get the ultimate and decisive perfection of any action. Do you order it in charity towards God and the ultimate goodness? That is why St. Alphonsus Liguori, who is the patron saint of theologians and moral theologians and confessors, says in his work, um, uh, duo precepta caritatis in decium legis precepta, de delectione dei, uh, uh, num, chapter 8, number 3, says, it is not enough to do good works. They need to be done well. For our works to be good and perfect, they must be done for the sole purpose of pleasing God. That's the reason. And this is extremely important. When you think about something more at home than either uh, communism or national socialism, when we are dealing with questions about abortion, you'll have people say, well, we don't want children born into a family when they're not wanted. Do you want unwanted children? Well, gee, I, I guess not. Well, therefore, kill them. Oh, wrong answer. You cannot do that kind of intrinsic evil of killing an innocent child in the womb just because you suppose the child will not be wanted. And maybe it, the child is not wanted because the pregnancy is not expected which, by the way, applies to the majority of people in the history of the world. Most pregnancies are relatively unplanned. Um, I've got three siblings who belong in that category. And so this is typical of human history. But, but, that doesn't mean they won't be loved after they're born and that you can't predict that, and you do an intrinsic evil of killing them because you are afraid they might not be wanted, and that's unacceptable. Or that they might not get a, a, a adopted by a family that does want them. It's unacceptable. Our actions must be oriented to the goodness of God who created the soul of every child, and these children may not be killed and rejected. Now we begin uh, the last section of this chapter. Um, it is entitled Intrinsic Evil. It is not licit to do good, 
or to, excuse me, it's not licit to do evil so that good may come of it. And that's from Romans 3, verse 8. So in paragraph 79, the Pope s- starts off, one therefore must reject the thesis of these teleological and proportionalist theories, the thesis that holds that it is impossible to qualify as morally evil according to its species or its object. The deliberate choice of certain kinds of behavior or specific acts. You cannot, according to these people, you cannot say that any action is intrinsically evil, such as killing an innocent child. You can't say that it's intrinsically evil. You have to consider the intention for which the choice was made or the totality of foreseeable consequences of that act for all persons concerned. In other words, what did people think was going to happen? And that's, again, if that's the case, if you accepted this proportionalist theory or teleological theory, you would say, well, look, the abortionists just don't want, their intention is to not want unwanted children. Therefore, it is not evil for them to do something immoral. It has gotten so bad. I remember reading some of the journal, uh, it was a magazine by college, uh, for college professors, in which students at the universities, in the history classes, found themselves reluctant to condemn the Nazi horrors. Why? They said, well, I wouldn't kill the Jews or the gypsies or the homosexuals. I wouldn't put them in a camp. But how can I say that it wasn't okay for the Nazis? What is behind that statement? Besides a lack of clear thinking. What is a lack of clear thinking? Because they they said that. Because they said, well, maybe they had a good intention. And therefore, it's not bad for them. That was the reasoning. And and the Pope is saying, we cannot accept that kind of bad reasoning. The action of killing innocent people in the womb or walking around the streets or going about their business, that is inherently immoral and inherently against what God has set up. So that the primary and decisive element for moral judgment is not the intention of the person doing something, but rather it is the object of the human act. The act itself has inherent goodness or evil in it. And the act establishes whether the act is capable of being ordered to the good and to the ultimate end, which is God, or within the action, you can see that it is not ever oriented towards God and the good he wants. Hence, with abortion, that is, when he creates a soul, he never creates it so that, oh, other people have a good intention, though they can go ahead and kill it. Unacceptable thinking or lack of thinking. This capability of being ordered to the good is able to be grasped by reason. You can use your mind to think through the issues. And reason, that is the ability to think, to know, to better understand by using logical thought, this is at the, in the very being of man, and it is part of human integral truth. The animals do not have capacity to reason. They have their instincts, and they, they're supposed to follow them. But we can go beyond our instincts and think about very complicated thoughts and issues and, think, and come to a good analysis of them 
by which morality is understood. And therefore, being able to think and use human reason is part of human natural inclinations. We, we tend to think about it. Even small children begin to get a few ideas. Of course, a lot of times they're just following whatever pops in their mind. But sometimes they will sit down and you parents watch that, how that happens. And it, it, sometimes it's real cute because they don't know enough. But they are trying to figure out why things are the way they are. And also, human motivation and finalities, that is, the goals toward which you're going, your ends, your purposes, always have a spiritual dimension because they, the goodness of all reality is oriented towards God. So our spirituality comes into play. It is precisely these that are the content of natural law. Natural law comes from thinking about the inherent goodness of certain actions or uh, on the basis of whether they are oriented towards God. That's where natural law comes into play. And that there is uh, an ordered complex of personal goods, the number of good things inside each person. And they serve the good of the person. You want to see how, again, thinking ahead, that the ultimate good for each person is always God himself. He's the ultimate good. And that good is the person who has a dignity given by God because each and every human being is made in the image and likeness of God. The animals are not. The animals are wonderful. I love that. I, I, you know, whether it's pets that are comforts to us and interesting parts of our family or whether it's animals in the wild. It, these are wonderful, wonderful creatures. But they do not have the same inherent good that we human beings have because we are made in the image and likeness of God. They are not. We can have reason, and on the basis of reason and knowledge, we have free will because we know we have choices, and then we can make those choices with a free will. And this is the ultimate good of the person and the ultimate perfection of the person in relationship to God himself. These inherent goods of the person are safeguarded by the commandments of God. That that's what God is doing. That's why he says, thou shalt not murder. Honor your father and mother so that you... Honor your mother and father who give you life and God used to bring you into life and you also honor the lives of other people so you can't murder them. You honor their right to privacy, to, to uh, property and the ability to economically determine themselves. You honor their right to the truth and you don't bear false witness. All of these things are goods inherent in each person, and the commandments want us to protect them, including that there is only one God who is himself so holy that he must be adored and worshipped as our ultimate perfection. St. Thomas wrote about this in the Summa Theologiae, the Secundi Secundae, question 100, answer 1, I believe it is, where St. Thomas wrote, it is therefore evident that since the moral precepts are about matters which concern good morals, and since good morals are those which are in accord with reason, and since every judgment of human reason must needs be derived in some way from natural reason, it follows of necessity that 
all the moral precepts belong to the law of nature, but not all in the same way, that some laws are more important than others. For instance, it is more important to preserve the life of a person than it is to preserve property. So, for instance, if there is somebody who's in a burn, burning building, then it is completely legitimate to knock down the doors or whatever else you have to break in order to save the person from the burning property because their life is more important than the property. And this is something that is very important. So this is the, the natural law. And that as we think about these laws and the commandments of God, we realize the priority that they have, which ones are more important than the others. And that is our duty to take time to think so that we can make choices for acts that in themselves are morally right and avoid actions that in themselves are inherently evil. In that way, we seek the perfection that God gives, which is ultimately eternal life in heaven. All right, we're going to take a break. Stop right there and come back and get some of your emails, your calling questions, the questions from the audience. So please stay with us. Thank you very much. And first of all, I'd like to invite you to come and join us here in beautiful Irondale, Alabama. Uh, if you make a pilgrimage to EWTN, please contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966 or go to the website EWTN.com and they will give you information about when we have uh, time for live studio uh, audience participation and also times for masses, directions to Hansville to go pray with the sisters and all that other good stuff. So and plus places to stay and eat. And while you're at the website, please be sure to go to EWTN's religious catalog. You can get a new compilation of Mother Angelica's straightforward solutions to life's puzzling problems. It's put together in book form with the help of Christine Allison. It's called Mother Angelica's Answers, Not Promises. Just go to EWTNRC.com or call 1-800-854-6316. The item is number 800 Four, six. I remember when that book came out. Uh, oh, maybe that was in the 90s or so. And Mother Angelica went on to the Joan Rivers program. And I remember how Joan Rivers was so moved uh, by Mother and what she had to say in that book. She just started crying on the air. And Mother just prayed with her. Mother was real sweet to her. She made a real connection with uh, Ms. Rivers. So it's a, it's a great book and I highly recommend it. All right, let's start off with a phone call. We have James on the line. Hello, James. Hello. Hi, where are you from? Uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. We're mourning the loss of our dear friend, Father Bob Levis. His yes. funeral mass is tomorrow, June 1st. So keep him in your prayers. Please. Oh, yeah, please, everyone. Uh, just to remind people, Father Robert Levis was on the programs for many years with Father Tregilio. Father John Tregilio was his faithful sidekick, 
and uh, they did the web of faith and all sorts of other stuff. And Father Levis was uh, just such a wise, wise priest, a uh, good, intelligent man and, and a very, very kind personality. And uh, he just passed away a few days ago. Thank you, James, for reminding me of that. Uh, I wanted to urge everyone to include uh, the repose of his soul in your prayers. But what else do you have for us, James? Yeah, well, my understanding, St. John the Baptist, he's conceived with original sin. Then in the womb, he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. So how does it, that affect the rest of his life? Did he have concupiscence? Did you, in your opinion, did he commit actual sin, whether venial or mortal? Did he have to struggle with temptation, etc.? Could you comment on that, please? Thank yeah, you. thank you, James. Um, we have uh, no evidence, one way or the other, whether after the Holy Spirit came upon John in the womb, that he committed sin or uh, was subject to concupiscence. Concupiscence, by the way, for those who don't know that word, is a term meaning disordered desires. There are, you know, a lot of people, you know, in fact, all of us have desires for good things, but we want too much of some things, usually the things that are bad for us, and not enough of the things that are good for us. And we have to learn to overcome some of those disordered desires. And we don't know if John had any of those. Um, so it'd be pure speculation. There are some who say that, well, he was cleansed of all sin from that point forward, but that's a theory. So I don't like to give my opinion about something I am completely ignorant of. And what you can do is wait to go meet St. John the Baptist uh, up in heaven. Um, and those of you who don't go to heaven will just never know. Well, we have another caller online. Hello, Jennifer. Yes, hi, Father. Hi, How where are you? are you from? Connecticut. Great, great. And what's your question? My question is, wondering why the uh, Catholic Church does not use the King James Version of the Bible. Other churches do use it, including Independent Baptist, and I am one. Mm -hmm. I was born again in Independent Baptist Church, mm -hmm. and I read the book every day. Yeah. It's very, very lyrical. It's very easy to understand. And I wonder why the Catholic Church shied away from that a long time ago. Okay, well, hold on a second now, Jennifer. I don't know if you know that there was a Catholic translation that came out at the same time. Did you know about that? The same time as King James? As a matter of fact, it came out two years ahead of the King James Bible. It's called the Douay Reims. Remember, at the time of King James, Catholicism was illegal in England. And Catholics were being martyred. Uh, uh, many priests were martyred under uh, Queen Elizabeth as well as under King James. So they, they did the translation in France. And it was uh, finished in 1609. But then... They, uh, the King James came out in 1611. And uh, ma'am, if you take a look, there's a, a, a wonderful book. One of my favorite writers, especially back in the 1970s as I was getting into more theology, one of my favorite writers was C.S. Lewis. Uh, do you ever read any of his work, Jennifer? And C.S. Lewis, uh, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. Yeah, right, right. I've right. never read that. Yeah, okay. Right. But I don't read that. I don't read that book. But, um, okay, well, no, well, he's, um, well, actually, C.S. Lewis has over 50 books. And there's one of his books that's very interesting. It, I believe it is the Oxford History of English Literature. And if it's not the Oxford, then it's the Cambridge History of English Literature. And he did the volume on 16th century, excluding... Uh, drama, that's what it's called. And in there, he brings up how the King James translators were using materials from 
the Catholic translation, the Catholic translation came out first and they used it, but then sometimes the King James came out and the Catholics used it. So the translations are similar. But then there was another problem. And if you ever get a chance to go down to Dallas, Texas, there is a wonderful, wonderful museum of, uh, that, that has, uh, I think it's, uh, oh, I, I just was there, um, I think it's called the Museum of the, uh, of the Bible. And in that museum, they have a 1611 King James Bible, one of the first. And they also have uh, another, uh, uh, I think a 1613 edition and a 1627. And here was our problem, Jennifer, as Catholics. The 1611 edition of the King James Bible had all the 73 books of the Bible. But in the 1627 edition, they removed seven books and kept only 66. This apparently, according to the, um, again, I think it's the Oxford History of the Bible, this was a decision made at a, a Puritan print shop. It was not made by any church authority, and certainly not by King James, um, the, so that the original King James Bible had all 73 books, but the 1627 edition removed it. And we Catholics will not, you know, uh, go along with taking books out of the Bible. We can't do that. Those books, by the way, had been in every copy, every Christian copy of the Bible as far back as we know. That goes back to the fourth century A.D. Those are our oldest complete copies of the Bible in the, 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 the 300s. And we, we Christians are not allowed to remove books. Now, they were removed by the Puritans because, for instance, in 2 Maccabees, it talked about praying for the souls of the dead and offering sacrifice for them. And then also, uh, that's in 2 Maccabees 12, and in 2 Maccabees 15, it talks about the intercession of the saints, praying for the people of Israel, uh, uh, like Elijah and Jeremiah. So uh, we, we can't do that. So that's why we don't use the King James. As beautiful as it is, uh, removing books from the Bible is unacceptable. Okay? All right. We have another caller. Hello, Carol. Carol, are you online? Yeah. Hi, where are you from? Aberdeen, South Dakota. Great. And what is your question, ma'am? Yeah? Who was Mary related to John the Baptist's mother? Yes. She was, we don't know how exactly, but she is called... Elizabeth's kinswoman. And uh, we don't know exactly the precise relationship between Mary, Our Lady and Elizabeth, but they are called relatives and uh, uh, probably through marriage because Our Lady belonged to the tribe of Judah and Elizabeth belonged to the tribe of Levi. But they could well have been related by uh, marriage. For instance, um, St. Joachim was the father of Our Lady, and he was from the tribe of Judah. Well, we don't know about her mother, St. Anne. She might have been from the tribe of Levi. And they had been from Jerusalem. Uh, they lived in Jerusalem. So this is something that uh, it may well be on her mother's side, that's speculation, that she would have that, okay? All right, now we have an email here, and this one is from Patricia in Shreveport, Louisiana. 
It says, Father Mitch, our son has started going to church again and went to reconciliation after a very long time. Thanks be to God. Amen. He is in the military, so please pray for him. As a matter of fact, yesterday, of course, we celebrated Memorial Day. And we pray for all the military who have died. Uh, but it's also important for us to remember to pray for those who are still living. We have many men and women in the military still who are, uh, you know, in other countries and are, have continued fighting on in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. So keep them, all of us should keep them in our prayers. Now, my son has been reading the Bible and asked how the apostles knew about Jesus being tempted in the desert because Jesus had not chosen his apostles until after this had happened. It seems this way to him because this is the order it falls in the Bible in each of the Gospels. So Patricia and Shreveport. Well, we don't have any place where it says how Jesus told them things. But we do know this, uh, Patricia, that throughout the Gospels, Jesus took the apostles, especially the 12 apostles, and on certain occasions, he took three of them apart even from the 12, and he would teach them privately. And this especially goes on when we take a look uh, at the, after the resurrection. After the resurrection, he explains his life as the fulfillment of the Old Testament law and prophets. And he goes through passages of the Old Testament and explains to them privately, both to the two disciples on the way to Emmaus, as well as to the a group of apostles in the upper room on Easter Sunday night. And in those private times of explanation, Jesus taught them a number of things. And I suspect myself, it might well have been at the, uh, the explanations after the resurrection, because when he is tempted... He is talking about a number of passages from Deuteronomy 6 and 8, as well as Psalm 91. And as he's explaining, the, you know, using that in the temptations, he may well have used that occasion to explain the scriptures to the apostles. Now, again, we don't have him doing that, but it is the kind of thing Jesus was doing to them privately explaining how he fulfilled the Old Testament. And the, um, certainly part of that include, would have included the temptations. So that would make sense there. Okay? So I hope that sons and tell your son to keep on studying his scripture and asking good questions. And if you can, get him a copy of um, Archbishop Sheen on CD or uh, MP3. You can get it too. Uh, might be easier for him to carry around. And it is, uh, Life is Worth Living, get it from St. Joseph Communications. It's excellent, excellent to explain more questions about the faith. We have Tom on the line. Hello, Tom. Hi, Father. How are you today? I'm well, thanks. And where are you calling from? I'm calling from Long Island, New York. Long Island, New York. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your question, Tom? Well, I wanted to get your take, Father, on um, pro-choice Catholics and Christians. Um, it's very clear to me in Luke's Gospel that when the Blessed Virgin comes within cheat of St. Elizabeth, John the Baptist leaps in her womb. Mm -hmm. And if that isn't proof of life at conception, I don't know what is. Yep. As a matter of fact, Tom... There's an issue uh, just on science, apart from revelation, that's in science. From the very second that the sperm fertilizes the ovum, 
So this is at the very beginning that at that moment, all of the DNA of that person is fully present. They will not gain any new DNA, nor will they lose any, right? <laughs> and that's just, that's basic science. And now science shows that they, that the child in the womb can feel the pain of being cut to pieces during the abortion, because that's what they do. They cut off the arms and legs and then crush the skull. And the child is able to feel that pain. And if you want, you can take a look at the video called The Silent Scream. It is unbelievably powerful because in it, you can see the little baby as you know, it was an ultrasound of an abortion. And the little baby is punching at the knife and kicking at it to save his little life. Certainly uh, an instinctive uh, kind of reaction rather than well thought out, but the child is fighting for its life. And yet we see a lot of people say, oh, that's gruesome to show. You think that's gruesome to show? What about gruesome to do? Wouldn't that be a good question? But here's the other thing. A lot of times you have pro-life Christians and, excuse me, pro-abortion Christians and pro-abortion atheists alike for whom the issue is not concern for the child. The issue is about politics. And that is, they, a lot, especially of pro-abortion Catholics, they say, well, it's the law. So, you know, I can't impose my morality because the law allows it. No, the law didn't allow it. There's no law saying it's okay to have an abortion. It is a decision by nine men based on faulty science, as they themselves later admitted. And this decision by the court decriminalized abortion rather than permitted it by law. So there's no law permitting it. It's decriminalized. And secondly, that these pro-abortion folk who call themselves Catholics and other Christians, I suspect that in many cases it has nothing to do with abortion, but rather being able to go along with their political allies and get their support and show them support and not to break ranks. This is you know, something that would seem to me undemocratic, that in a democracy such as ours, the different opinions ought to be expressed. And if these people who do use various elements to say that even though a significant part of the culture says that it's okay to commit murder, we are still going to put murderers in prison. They impose that morals, right? If some people say, well, look, you know, I'm poor and I have a right to steal and I should take stuff that belong to the rich. That's all I'm going to steal. Well, that goes against your morals. But you impose that morality on the thieves, don't you? You arrest the thief and put him in jail for a time for stealing property even though they feel it's okay. Well, if you don't mind imposing your morality with actual law, there are laws prohibiting murder, first, second, and third degree, as well as manslaughter. And there are laws prohibiting stealing, including grand larceny and petty larceny. If you will impose those morals, what makes you hesitate to impose morality? that is against killing a child in the womb who has harmed no one. So 
be more willing to challenge them. I like to. Let's go to another call. We have Mary on the line. Hello, Mary. Mary, are you there? Hello. Hello, Hi. Father. Uh, yes, I'm here. Um, I've, I'm calling from Kansas. Great. Hope you're safe out there. I understand a lot of storms been going on. Uh, yes. We, right now it's nice, though, and sunny. Oh, good. good. So we're, we're fine right now. Good, good. But what can we do for you today? Well, uh, Father, I would, wanted to ask your expertise about 16th century Reformation. Uh, this is a question about indulgences. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Catholic. My husband is Lutheran. We've been married for 40 years. He's interested in the Catholic Church, but he's been taught that uh, the Pope and, and priests during the uh, 16th century sold indulgences to fund St. Peter's. Mm -hmm. And I think there may have been some abuses, but I really don't know, you know, the story. So if you could enlighten me and sure. give me a good answer to tell Ken, I would sure. really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, St. Peter's Basilica was collapsing. It was built by Constantine and Pope Leo, well, Pope uh, uh, Alexander VI and Julius II and, uh, saw that it was collapsing. So, and, and Leo the, the X, I believe, was the one who finally had it wrecked, uh, tore it down because it was too dangerous. And they began to build the new St. Peter's Basilica, the magnificent basilica that we see today. And there were sales of indulgences. In fact, the list of the, the uh, money that people would offer for the indulgences was given. Uh, you can still see it online. You can, it's, it's public information, and you can look it up. And it's interesting, there's a scale. The wealthiest would pay more down to the poorest who paid nothing. If you were a very poor person, th then the indulgence just said, say certain prayers at, the, at church. But if you had more money than you, you uh, were to give, and it was to build St. Peter's. Now, there were, of course, abuses. Your, your husband is absolutely right. And in fact, that one of the uh, big issues at the Council of Trent that was held in response to the Protestant Reformation was to call the preachers and everybody else in the church to cease and desist from the abuses. And they did stop. They did. They, they, they stopped selling them. Here was the idea behind selling them. Originally, the idea of, you know, you'd go to confession and the penances given by the Irish monks were very strict. If you committed adultery, for instance, you could be on bread and water for 14 years. Or if you uh, committed murder, you would be on bread and water for 21 years. So what they then said is, well, if you instead of, because people stopped going to confession, they didn't want to get that kind of uh, penance. So what they did is they would then say, all right, the money I would have spent on meat over that 21 years, I'm going to give as an indulgence. That will make up for it. So you took time off of the penance imposed on you. Or you could say certain prayers. Prayers were given a certain number of days or years indulgence that were not years or days off of purgatory, but they were years or days off the penance that belonged to your sin after you'd gone to confession. But again, you know, all those abuses were corrected and uh, you, uh, the indulgences were no longer sold. The, it made very clear this is not a money-making scheme that had to stop. And instead, we realize that it is the free grace of God that is necessary to bring mercy and reconciliation to us. And so that reform happened within the church. Sadly, because of the uh, bad behavior, the Reformation took on steam and brought separation to the church. 
I hope your husband is reconciled and that you know, authentic Catholic teaching as it's been corrected is something that he comes to love and cherish. All right, we've run out of time and we have no indulgence on that. So may the Lord bless you and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And remember, this network is always brought to you by you. That's how Mother Angelica set it up. So we need you to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we will be able to pay our bills too. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you.